Yeah, I'm grateful and uh, I think it's a great privilege to uh, have been invited to speak at this occasion. Uh, Yvonne ha has been holding the fort, I think that's something one can say, for such a long time. Uh, in the beginning, all by herself. Now, fortunately, there are uh, many young people uh, who are going to carry on. Uh, for example, we heard his talk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess there has, there's nobody besides Yvonne who has looked at the equations from so many different points of view. So um, I'm going to speak about anti desitter type space-time. We heard about the Cauchy problem, that is of course the most important thing. We heard about characteristic problems. That is, the title was about characteristic problems. The talk wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, this is essentially a talk about um, initial boundary value problems. So I start by saying something about uh, anti desitter. Twenty years ago, anti desitter space was, was a very quiet and peaceful space. And if you did some work on it, you could be sure not to raise too much discussions. Then came Aldesina, then came ADS-CFT, and now there are thousands and thousands of references, and you could think everything has been solved. But the question which are asked by the classical mathematical relativists are still unsolved. And I want to talk about some of them. <coughs> I start by uh, recalling uh, what anti de Sitter is. In, uh, let's say, n uh, equal to 4 or larger space-time dimensions, it's given by <coughs> this manifold and this line element, where r is a standard radial coordinate on this component. It's a solution to Einstein's field equation with negative cosmological constant. Um, if you do uh, conformal rescaling and an associated coordinate transformation, I've written down these things, then you get this re a conformal representation of this metric. And one of the uh, important features is if you look at this thing, you see this is a line element on the sphere, and you can easily extend it smoothly uh, <coughs> to a semi-sphere. And the whole thing then lives on R cross half of a sphere, where the boundary is included, and the boundary itself is diffeomorphic to R cross a sphere two-dimension lower. So that's what anti desitter space is. <coughs> um, I tell you what I understand under anti desitter type space time. I'm thinking I'm not doing this in the formal way. And principally, these things have been around for 50 years, and I don't want to repeat everything. So I shall refer to solutions to Einstein's field equation with negative cosmological constant which emit in a similar way a smooth conformal extension, which adds a time-like hypersurface that represents time-like and null infinity as an ADS uh, type spacetime. Um, well, there there uh, are various ways to generalize ADS. One can often find the word asymptotically ADS spacetime. This would be one of them, but one could think of uh, weaker notions, by which I mean you have less regularity at, at infinity. Um, this is not important for me. For me, it's just convenient to use this definition, and I will stick to it. But in principle, one might think of generalizing everything I, I'm, I'm going to talk about. Now, the main feature of ADS is that it's quite different from uh, the problems, global problems on ADS is that they are quite different from those are for the Zitter type or Minkowski type uh, solutions. I show you the picture. There it is. 
This is the uh, conformally extended anti de Zitter space time. We have this time like boundary, and it's clear, and you find it almost explained almost in every uh, article that this thing is not globally hyperbolic. If you fill a, a, in any acronal uh, hypersurface, yeah, there's always a possible for a time like curve just to vanish at the boundary. So that's the first statement. And then there's a second statement. And that statement you find almost nowhere, except here. Um, uh, and that is ADS does not admit a smooth, finite, conformal representation of past or future time like infinity. In the Zeta space, you have this. In Minkowski space, you have this. But here, you don't have this. Nevertheless, you can find sometimes in the literature that people do a conformal rescaling, and then they get a point, and they call this future time like infinity, and a point which they call past time like infinity. But it's more or less completely useless and misleading because it's not smooth. And the point of the conformal extension is that it's smooth. <coughs> Um, this is clear that this uh, poses problems. This is not so clear, but I guess those who maybe in 20 years or 100 years are going to prove something global about ADS, they will feel that this is important. OK, what can we do about solutions? Um, there's a certain history to this. Pfefferman and Graham, and later in a similar way in Graham and Hirachi, they studied formal expansions. They assume a Gauss-type coordinate system based on the conformal boundary and study formal expansion in terms of the ingoing coordinate. They get Taylor expansion at the boundary when the space-time dimension is even. And they get a polyhomogeneous expansion if the space-time dimension is odd. Polyhomogeneous meaning uh, expansion in terms of a radial coordinate and uh, its logarithm. And if the if the data uh, on 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 this boundary, which I call squi, are analytic, they get real analytic solutions near that boundary. Uh, that may be useful for some purposes. It has been co considered by, by quite a few people. It's not what I'm looking at for, uh, for, for some, several reasons. First, I think analyticity is not a, a requirement which I, I, I like. It's not for our purpose important. Secondly, what, we are, what they are doing is they study a Cauchy problem with data on a time-like hypersurface. And it's, it's known that these Cauchy problems are not well posed. And what is even more seriously, if they do this uh, expansion uh, with data on Scry and then they extend into the interior, there's no guarantee that this closes to a smooth interior or can be extended to another boundary at infinity. There's no control on that. So that's the reason why I'm not looking at this. What, what we have to do instead is to study the initial boundary value problem, where we look again at this picture here, where we uh, uh, prescribe data on a space-like hyperfair surface, which looks like this, and on this time-like boundary. The basic question then is, how are the boundary conditions and data to be formulated to obtain well posed initial boundary value problems for Einstein's field equation coupled to suitable matter fields. And of course, we want these problems to produce anti de Zitter type solutions. <coughs> there exists quite some literature now on test fields on ADS or on asymptotically ADS backgrounds, or maybe some sense uh, asymptotically ADS backgrounds. I've listed here a few. Maybe there are a few which escape me. I apologize for this. I don't know whether it's complete. 
uh, it's all interesting and important work. <coughs> they discuss various ill and well posed and little boundary value, uh, value problems based on various choices of boundary conditions. Now, the boundary is defined here by in terms of its conformal structure. So it's clear that the conformal behavior of the test fields will play a role when you discuss the boundary uh, value problem. Uh, if you have conformally covariant field equations, like Maxwell's equation or Young-Mills equation, then this boundary is as good as any other time-like boundary. The equations just don't feel it. But you could imagine that you have equations which do not interact nicely with conformal rescaling. I call this conformally ill-behaved, which is a notion which is, is ill-defined. But uh, still, <laughs> one can imagine that one has such things. And in that case, the discussion will be fairly difficult. Now, if you want to say something about Einstein's field equations, then you don't want to fiddle around with these complicated situations. Therefore, I look at the vacuum case first. And I, uh, I shall recall a pre-Maldacena result. I mentioned this because if I had decided to, uh, to do this after Maldacena, and have been, had been uh, influenced by all this ADS CFT stuff, I might have asked different questions. But the, because this was before, I just asked the standard questions. First, how many of these uh, solutions exist? Second, how can you characterize them in terms of data? And then third, there was a, is, is this initial boundary value problem. There was almost nothing known about general initial boundary value problem. And this is a very nice example that comes in naturally and in a geometric way. And that, that I found interesting at the time. OK. Here is, a, is, a, is a, an existence result. We choose a positive and negative lambda. That's fairly easy. Then uh, we consider three-dimensional Cauchy data. So there's a, a three-dimensional manifold. There's a, a symmetric, and there's a second fundamental form for this equation. S hat is supposed to be orientable, open, and S hat H hat is supposed to be complete. And the whole thing is supposed to have a smooth conformal completion, which is such that to as had we attach a, a, a boundary surface, sigma, which is compact, a compact smooth manifold, so that the whole thing is compact. We assume that omega is a defining function uh, of sigma. And we assume that these rescalings result in, uh, in, in smooth fields. And this uh, metric is, is uh, non-degenerate on the boundary. Furthermore, we require that the conformal wild tensor, which we can calculate from these data, uh, uh, can be uh, rescaled with this conformal factor. And what we get has a smooth limit at the boundary. So we assume such data on some space-like slice. Then we need to introduce boundary data on R cross ds. We assume that there is given a smooth three-dimensional Lorentzian conformal structure. And then we have to say something how these things fit together. And I refer to this picture again. Uh, we want to create this picture. We have given something here, and we have given something here. And uh, <coughs> it's clear that these things somehow have to fit together. And to, you need to impose conditions here on this boundary that these things fit together nicely. And they are co uh, these conditions are referred to as corner conditions. Uh, 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 yeah, corner conditions. I am going to, to say more about the con corner conditions later on. <coughs> these corner conditions, of course, have to do with the field equations. And I should say, 
I'm working completely in the conformal picture. I'm rewriting the, the field equation in terms of conformal field, and the equations I have I call conformal field equations. Um, now, assume that these things are given, then they exist on a set of this form. So it's S, S, now that should be a, a, a hat, not a tilde. So uh, it's an, it's an uh, interval, an open interval called S hat. Uh, there exists a solution that should also be hats uh, with a smooth conformal extension uh, which looks the way we want to, to do, uh, 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 want it to look. And this solution induces on S and on this boundary piece, the given data, up to a diffeomorphism. Again, I refer to this picture. Uh, what I'm saying is we prescribe data here, we prescribe data on the boundary, and then we get a solution in some domain, I don't know, I don't say how far it extends in time, it's just local in time. Okay, um, there are th three things we have to talk about. We have to talk about the Cauchy data, how do we get them? We have to talk about the Lorentzian conformal structure, the boundary data. What do we have to say about them? And we have to talk about the corner conditions. And I'm going to do that now. First talk about the data. Fortunately, that's the easiest part because the work had been done already. Uh, if you know, it had been done. Now, the, the ob observation is the following. If we want to construct ADS type solution, which are time reflection symmetric, you assume that the second fundamental form vanishes on the slice, and the constraint then reduces just to this equation. And then you have to wonder what are the asymptotic conditions, and you find out the asymptotic conditions are similar to those required on hyperboloidal hypersurfaces, which are hypersurfaces in a space with vanishing cosmological constant, which extend up to square. On the other hand, these gentlemen studied vacuum, the vacuum solution with lambda equal to zero with the assumption that the second fundamental form is pure trace and the trace itself does not vanish. If this is satisfied and is constant, then the momentum constraint is satisfied and the Hamiltonian constraint just reduces to this. And they discuss uh, uh, solutions to this, which are, uh, to this which are conformally smooth at infinity. And if you look at this, you see if you have these guys, you get those guys. That's the main observation. If you have hyperboloidal data, they give you Cauchy data. It's just a reinterpretation of some constant. Now, Anderson and Kruschel, they studied more general hyperboloidal data, and Kana generalized this correspondence. So in principle, from the point of view of, of uh, Cauchy data, we are in a good position. There are still generalizations possible, but I'm not going to talk about this. An interesting point is the topology of this boundary is not restricted by these, by these constructions. The boundary is just a, a, a boundary of an orientable three manifolds. There are no further conditions. Um, so uh, the, C, uh, the, the three manifold is fairly, fairly general. Um, if you look at th this article and in this article, in particular at this article, there have been constructed more general data, data which are rough at space like infinity in the sense that you have uh, polyhomogeneous expansion. You could think of uh, constructing ADS type solution with more general uh, uh, asymptotics, but this is not, not so easy. And I didn't make the slightest uh, attempt to do this. If you want to establish this picture, 
and you have a solution which are rough here, and you want to construct a solution which extends to the future of the domain of dependence, so which is going beyond the ingoing null hypersurface, you have to be very careful and to arrange things very careful, if it's possible at all, such that the non-smoothness does not travel into the space-time. So I, I didn't make any attempt, but uh, everybody is invited to generalize that. So with the boundary data, we are in a nice position. Everything with, with the initial data. With the boundary data, it appears that we are even in a nicer position. There are no constraints required. We just say the boundary data is, uh, datum is given by a conformal structure. So it looks as if this is the easy part of the whole thing. Now there are a few subtleties behind that, and this is what I don't want to discuss, discuss now. Um, the proof of this result, which I quoted, uh, consists of two steps. You arrange an initial value problem uh, for, for the PDEs, which meant, means in particular you tr introduce uh, some gauge condition and so on. And then you try to get PDEs in a form to which you apply no knowledge about initial boundary value problems. And then there's a second step. Uh, you are forced into this more or less, such that you get a covariant formulation. Now, both things depend on very specific features of the ADS space-time. The first specific feature is the following. Denote by KAB and kappa AB the first and second fundamental form on the boundary. So kappa KAB is a Lorentzian metric. Then it's a fact that in a suitable conformal gauge, the second fundamental form on that boundary vanishes. Um, if you're in the wrong gauge, you find just that the trace fee part vanishes. That uh, <coughs> is a conformal density. But then you look at the transformation law for the trace, and you see you can choose the gauge uh, such that this thing vanishes altogether. This has, has conse uh, consequence, consequences, and that has to do with the gauge condition. You have to, to make a choice, and you have somehow to say where the boundary is. What I use is I use conformal geodesics. Conformal geodesics are conformally invariant, and they are associated with a conformal structure in a similar way, uh, uh, like uh, geodesics are associated with, with the metric but it's a more general class of, of equations. Anyway, you can prescribe data for them that they start orthogonal to the initial slice. And what you find if you prescribe data such that they are orthogonal to the initial slice and start uh, where the initial slice is supposed to intersect the boundary i, they stay on that boundary. And that means you start them, and they generate the boundary for you. OK, there are various things you have to do. You have to, to, to choose uh, uh, the conformal factor. Uh, it supplies also nicely a fra frame. You have to make a choice there. I say in a minute how you do that. What you get is something which I call conformal Gauss gauge. And it's a, in a way, it's very similar to, to a usual Gauss gauge. But I mean, there are certain differences. And what's nice about this, if you write down the uh, equations in U a human Penrose notation, uh, you could also write them differently. There are nowadays all kinds of notations around. Um, uh, then you get equation which looks like this. Uh, tau is a parameter on the conformal d 6 x al alpha are constant coordinates on the GD6. So here is just the derivative with respect to the parameter on the GD6. And u is a set of fields which comprise the frame coefficients, the connection coefficients with respect to the frame, and the Schouten tensor. I'm not going into any details, but it's remarkable that you have this kind of propagation equations. And then there is this tensor here. 
Uh, we have seen this tensor already before. We can require this to be smooth. So this is our basic unknown in the conformal field equation. In the spin length notation, it's a symmetric spinner. If you write down components, it's uh, five complex functions, and psi is supposed to be this vector. And the equation it satisfies are of this form. This makes it clear if you have a freedom on the boundary, the freedom can only be in these functions. If you want to discuss the freedom, you somehow have to adapt your frame to, to, to the geometry. And what I do is I choose this double null frame, which is in the human Penrose notation, which is such that the only non-vanishing scalar products are these here. So that the null vector L plus uh, the null vector L and N generate a time-like vector which is future directed and tangent to the boundary. The difference of these vectors is supposed to be normal to the boundary and inward pointing. And if you have this, these two guys are tangent to, to the boundary. And if you do this, then in the in the associated human Penrose notation. You, you find that the equations admit boundary conditions which are of this form. Psi 4 minus some function a times psi 0 minus c times psi 0 bar is equal to d, where the functions a and c are subject to some uh, uh, restriction, and d is a boundary data, and that can be prescribed completely freely. There's no constraints on this. I want to explain roughly how this thing comes out. We take the Bianchi equations. These are the equations satisfied by, the, by this tensor field W. These are eight equations. Uh, the set splits into two parts. One uh, part has uh, covariant derivative into the direction of n. and. Uh, Maybe I should draw a picture. By the way we fixed everything, n is outward pointing. Here's our manifold. And the way we have chosen n and l, things look like this. n is inward pointing, n is outward pointing. This means that those fields which occur here cannot be prescribed. They are already fixed by what's in the interior. You are, you're not allowed to touch them. This operator is inward pointing. And you see Psi 4 does not occur here. Psi 4 is the one which you may prescribe. And you can try to feed in information on Psi, psi 0 and uh, uh, impose conditions in A and C. And you can do it in such a way to get energy estimates. That's the basic of the existence proof. So we have a boundary value problem. Uh, that's a well posed PDE problem. And what's more, it preserves the constraints and gate condition. That the constraints are preserved is initial boundary value problems much more complicated than in, uh, initial value problems. So we are lucky that it works in that case. Oh, no, I'm going backwards. What is this? There's just one, one problem. Uh, I have to choose L and N, and I've chosen them such that L plus N is tangent to the boundary. But there are many time-like vectors tangent to the boundary, and there's no natural way to fix it, unless you have something like spherical symmetry, where there's a unique time-like vector orthogonal to, to, to the orbits of the symmetry group. So that's, that's, that's a problem, and that makes the formulation I've given there not, not covariant. If there are two guys, 
they, they, they try to produce uh, space time space times by following this recipe and if they ask each other do we get the same solution I mean or diffeomorphic solutions or not it's a priori not easy to get an answer to this but in this case of AD, ADS type solution it is possible uh, and I think that's very specific to ADS type space time and it relies on a specific feature and that's the following one by BAB I denote the dualized Cotton tensor of the metric KAB on the boundary. So that's the object which, if it vanishes, tells you that the boundary is conformally flat. By W star AB, I denote the <coughs> magnetic part of the tensor W with respect to the boundary. That is, I take a one-sided dual of this, connect, uh, contracted twice with an in, inward pointing normal, unit normal, and then I get that object. That's a, a, a spatial tensor on the boundary. And the special feature of ADS type spacetime is that you have such a relationship. So the Cotton tensor on the boundary is related directly to the uh, magnetic part on the boundary. <laughs> okay, now what you can do then is the following. You look at your boundary condition and you pick a particular uh, choice of these functions A and C, which were, were uh, fairly general, and you find if you take this particular choice, then you can rewrite this in this way if you use real notation, so dA are a, a real and imaginary component of d. And you see this is a linear combination of the electric part. And then you find something else that's uh, I, I, it's, it's really amazing how the equations know how to do that. Um, if these components are known to you, and you look at this differential identity, which holds in any case, then you see that this thing reduces to a hyperbolic system if the background is given. Now, you need to integrate the background as well, and you look at the structural equations for the normal conformal Cartan connection on the boundary, and you get a hyperbolic system which allows you, with the data given, on the initial slice to integrate the conformal structure of KAB on the boundary. That's just a fact. And uh, secretly, this uses again this condition on the second fundamental form. Conversely, if a conformal structure is given to you, you know now how to arrange the, the, the gauge which I, I discussed, and uh, it, it, the whole thing tells you that <coughs> these kind of boundary conditions are, together with the initial data, equivalent to giving the conformal structure. So it's a little bit more com complicated than one might think. Uh, I shall use this relationship again, uh, because it's, it's uh, making things a little bit clearer. But uh, the covariance uh, data are the conformal structures. Now, <coughs> I want to talk about reflecting boundary condition. In the sense, if you said d equal to 0, any of these boundary conditions could be uh, understood as reflecting boundary conditions. Yeah? Uh, the psi, which you may pre prescribe, is just obtained as a linear combination of the things which are outward transported. But we want to have gauge independence. That's the reason I look at this boundary condition. And I require this equality on the intersection of the initial slice with the boundary. And when I have this, these things together imply this. So I will refer to this condition as, conform as a reflective boundary condition or to this combination. Good, corner conditions. We can make it easy. If you have Cauchy data, you can calculate the solution up to any order you want. 
and the uh, formula expansion is determined uniquely in terms of the gauge. On the other hand, if you uh, have boundary data, you also have a, a formula expansion in terms of, of the coordinates. And what you have to make sure that these expansions coincide. And Borel's theorem says this can always be done, and there are many da uh, boundary data which you can prescribe so that this is satisfied. But I shall say a little bit more on this later on. Now, we have uh, now uh, an existence uh, problem uh, result locally in time, and now you may get more ambitious, and you, you uh, of course, would like to have uh, nonlinear stability. Everybody wants to have this these days. So if you're working on this, you will also want to have it. Now, first thing is to do linear stability. That has been discussed by Ishibashi et al. I don't want to go to into, into this. Recently, there were two different works uh, uh, related to nonlinear stability aspects, which had to do with ADS. And both works assume spherical symmetry. That's a good idea because it simplifies the analysis, which is not simple uh, anyway. And it may also simplify the numerics if you do conformal uh, 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 numerical calculations. So this implies conformal flatness of the boundary. So that's more or less reflecting boundary conditions. And they have a scalar field to retain some dynamics. Otherwise, there's nothing in it. There's a result by Holz, Egel, Egel and Smulivisi. It shows the stability of Schwarzschild ADS for spherical symmetric einstein klein gordon system with some assumptions on the klein gordon mass. It's an interesting result, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about it. But for the following reason, it has an outer boundary, which corresponds to our sky, but it also has an inner boundary, inner boundary that's a horizon through which gravitational radiation can escape. And this makes this problem different from the poor ADS problem. And the phenomena I want to discuss do simply not occur. So I forget about it and uh, consider some work in which only the outer boundary is considered. And in fact, the analysis stops as soon as some inner boundary is going to develop. That's a work by Bison and Rostworovsky. They study the spherical symmetric einstein maslatz scalar field system with lambda uh, 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 negative, homogeneous theory clay asymptotics for phi. They uh, uh, use Gaussian type initial data and calculate the solution numerically. And what they find, they found, find that uh, uh, for arbitrarily small initial data, they can form trapped surfaces. This is, I think, an amazing result. I was a little bit careful here. I will tell you small in numerics. This is something delicate, but the way they represent their data, it's very convincing that it should be, should be true even without, without, without these guys here. They perform a per perturbative analysis that's more or less pointing into the same direction, but it, it exhibits also some uh, uh, initial data which seem to develop into globally smooth solutions. And then they give evidence that the development of trapped surfaces, as they observe it, result from an energy transform, a transfer from low to high frequency modes. Um, that's a lot for, for those who haven't seen that before, but that's how it is. And this immediately uh, uh, started, uh, uh, made other people start to work on it. Diaz Horowitz and Santos, they also do a perturbative analysis with reflecting boundary condition for the full Einstein vacuum equations, and they get similar conclusions. In a sense, this, what they do, mimics what uh, Bison and Rostworovsky did, and I, I would say there's lots of, of space to, uh, to do more complete work on it. Buchel, Lena, and Lieblind, they also did numerical calculations. They reproduced, reproduced the results with a complex scalar field, 
And they observed, and this is a little bit more than shown there, that uh, if you have data close to the specific data which have exhibited here, you get global existence. Again, in the numerical uh, sense, but uh, nobody seems to have any doubts about it. So the result led Bison and Ross Borowski to con conjecture ADS is unstable against the formation of black holes for a large class of arbitrarily small perturbations. Just to make it clear, I think. Huh? Generic. <laughs> uh, generic, Nick. I, I pointed out that there is a class of, 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 of data which seem to be, I mean, to, to develop into one something. Direction. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. There's a, there's a kind of an island of, of stability, apparently. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I, 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 I should say not to uh, uh, generate a wrong impression that I find these results extremely interesting because of the work they have done and the questions they raise. And I have not the slightest doubt that this is something pointing to something really uh, concrete. However, I have a problem with the statement here. If that is meant to apply to general perturbations, it may be too strong. I think what they did rather suggests that ADS with reflecting boundary condition is unstable against the formation of black holes for a large class of arbitrarily small uh, perturbations. Now, I have been wondering all the time when I looked uh, at papers about a ADS that most people immediately uh, look at reflecting boundary conditions. They take that natural. Uh, some people refer even to this, uh, these uh, conditions as ADS boundary conditions. It's clear they are very convenient. You get a well-defined closed system with no information coming in or going out. Uh, the question, is this enough reason to concentrate on this, or should one look at these things in a more general way? But I, I don't quite understand this the statement. So you say ADS with reflecting boundary condition is not stable against the formation of black holes. So, it, so the formation of black holes for uh, small data will be an instability result. So yes, yes. You mean. see, uh, for a large class, <laughs> is somewhere so vague, yeah? And that this may change if you emit for more general boundary conditions. I, I'm going to discuss this. Yeah. <coughs> so I can understand that people consider these boundary conditions. And in itself, it's an interesting problem. The only thing which I find uh, disturbing is that may gen uh, generate the impression that's all what's to say about it. So a priori, these reflecting boundary conditions are not part of ADS. You put them in by hand. They are not forced on us. On us. On us. Moreover, they introduce unexplored difficulties. And this, uh, I think, is something for Jim. He's going to have a list on difficult, looming difficulties. Yeah? This is one of them. And the difficulty is, 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 is the following. We are no, uh, used from the Cauchy problem that you can separate the problem in two parts. There's a revolution problem and there's a constraint problem. And there's a clear separation between them. Of course, you have to show that the, that the uh, uh, constraints propagate, but that usually is not so difficult any longer after Yvonne told us how to do it. Um, but in this case, we have a problem. If you have initial boundary barrier problem, and impose restriction on the boundary data, this separation cannot be maintained any longer. And an extreme situation is the following. If you have reflecting boundary condition, it's not that they only prevent a flow of gravitation in or out of the system across the boundary. What they do, they require the Cauchy data to satisfy beyond being hyperboloidal at space like infinity, rather strong additional fall-off conditions at space like infinity. And this comes about... We will see it uh, 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 immediately. 
uh, this comes about as follows. If we want to have reflecting boundary condition, I told you we re require this on the section, intersection of the space-like slice and the boundary. And we want to have psi 4 is equal to psi 0. And to have smooth solutions, you have to require this uh, for all k. Now, if you now look at the evolution equation, you can calculate expression for this in terms of the initial data. And that means you get an infinite uh, sequence of, of, of differential conditions on the initial data. So, Jim, tomorrow, yeah? <laughs> this, this is a complicated thing, yeah? Uh, I have not the slightest idea whether one could do something with a conformal method. Uh, up until fairly recently, uh, gluing was also not so clear. Maybe something has been done. Uh, I, I don't know. So this is a real problem. And uh, I, I, I did not touch this at all. Now, uh, we have had this in other uh, situations where we prescribe Cauchy data and do an evolution where, where we assumed some extra conditions besides uh, fall off. And uh, uh, there was no problem. But the situation is different here. There, we just prescribe these data and let things go. And the equation said, OK, I do something with this. Here, we insist on this at all times. Yeah, so we are constructing a, a curve in this set of reflecting, uh, I mean, uh, uh, on this set of Cauchy data, which satisfy these conditions. So, and the question is, these additional fall-off conditions, do they possibly contain the seed of the formation of trapped surfaces? I have no idea, but it's a possibility. In that problem, which was studied by Bison and Rostworowski, you have the situation Solution is going out, it's reflected, it's going out, it's reflected. And assuming that the uh, observation is correct, the, the, the solution is reprocessed in a way that the, the, that the energy is going always into the higher modes. Yeah? So that's what's, what's done by these uh, uh, data. I have no idea in, in which way it comes about, but I guess it may be a real problem and it's a very interesting, but also difficult one. Now, <coughs> there are other problems which are uh, not more definite, uh, less definite than that one. I think if we f fix our work on reflecting boundary conditions, that precludes all kinds of investigations of more general situations, situations which are possibly of interest in applications. Having said this, you could ask, are there any applications of this? And this is one of the main problems. What is the meaning of these ADM type solutions? Uh, some people say, oh, they do, uh, they, they pre represent uh, isolated gravitating system. Some people talk about boson stars. And then some of them still use reflecting boundary condition. If I have an object which I call a star, whatever it is, and if it's confined by uh, 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 reflecting boundary conditions, I think the astrophysicists can forget about it. Yeah? There's no way of this thing to interact with the rest of the world. Yeah, so if you, if you uh, suppress this interaction, it's not so clear to, to say what it is. Again, from the mathematical point of view, all these things are interesting. And maybe it's a first step to understand the whole thing. But uh, there is a question. And one of the questions is, you have no idea what this thing means physically, which gives you no hint of what you should require, what would be a reasonable assumption. There's another problem. If you look at the Zitter type or Minkowski type space time, there the conformal boundary uh, splits into two components. 
there's one component where gravitational can enter, and there's another component where it leaves the space time. Here, it is one component, and in principle, radiation can enter and leave the space time. And it's very complicated to make a distinction between entering and leaving radiation. OK, then the question is, what do we do? Of course, I don't know. I don't even know what stability should mean here in this context. Uh, my best advice would be try to characterize those boundary conditions and data for which solutions which start close to ADS stay close to ADS for all times. Um, this is a task. It's not so easy. But if one could characterize these, these data, one could also get an impression what's in the uh, uh, solution manifold and how we should understand this. Yeah, and what I do think, if you look again at the, my big, uh, remark in the beginning, if you look at the global causal structure of ADS, I think it will in general only be reasonable to require globally bounded in time, maybe relative to ADS. I mean, uh, I don't think it makes a sense to require that things are uh, falling, falling off and go to zero as t goes to infinity or minus infinity. OK, that's what I wanted to say. Questions? Yeah, uh, I would like to ask a question coming back to the work of Piotr Bilsam. Yes. Uh, you said that the boundary condition depend on the system study. On the matter yes. Yes. Uh, they studied the scalar. Yes. Uh, <coughs> as far as I remember, he mentioned that there is no freedom in choosing boundary conditions. Yes. Can yes. you comment on this? No, I mean, if, if, if he, he wanted to have some sort of smoothness, and then he is forced into this. There may be other arguments. I think what you had, you had some energy defined on these things. And that energy, which they defined, is only finite if you impose such boundary condition. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So there may be different reasons uh, uh, why you do this. But uh, I mean, that's how it is. Yeah. 